Hey guys, I was about to do a review on gamma functions and um, I thought I will try and do that review with you together while doing it on the board. As we go through the chapters on uh, special functions and on partial differential equations um, that solve um, such problems as steady state temperature in a cylinder or in a sphere, all the time the solutions uh, are in the form of partial differential equations and um, the functions that uh, are solutions to those are usually in the form of special functions like Bessel functions, um, Lejeune polynomials, and many times in those uh, final expressions for those functions, um, gamma functions do come up to simplify the final expression so that we can uh, use it in an exact form uh, instead of just trying to do numerical approximations because what the gamma functions do, they help us to express a factorial of negative numbers or a factorial of non-integer numbers or non-integer negative numbers. And I found myself really struggling with that topic uh, when we started the chapter. In the past couple days I've been reviewing and studying that stuff. Today I wanted to uh, go over it one more time, uh, do a second review on that, um, which is part of the space repetition uh, I'm trying to do on that topic so that I remember it for good because it comes up all the time. So I was gonna do a quick uh, review and rundown from where the gamma functions are coming from, how we can use that, and also do a few examples. Just on the using and manipulating gamma functions, we're expressing some integrals in terms of gamma functions. And then later on, I might show you how those come up in more difficult problems like solutions to vessel equations and things like that. All the things that I'm trying to uh, show here are from my textbook. I'm going to show you. So all the things are from this textbook. Uh, I do, um, I did study it extensively over the weekend and over the last week. Uh, it seems to me like I read all, <laughs> every chapter. I skimmed many of the chapters. I, I was trying to find connections because I'm a type of person, if I'm studying something, uh, it's not sufficient for me to know how to do it. I usually get often stuck on why we do it. And that why question usually uh, nags me all the time. And, and so is the case with the gamma functions. I understood how to use that. I understood where they came from. But there are a couple things that they're still a mystery to me. And I'm going to take care of this by asking my professor this week. But for now, I know I can use them. And that's a progress, at least at that part. So the originally gamma functions came from the factorial function, uh, as far as I understood this. And the factorial function was defined um, as following. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I have to get rid of that squiggle because I was I drew that line to make sure my camera is focused on the board. Okay, so the factorial function is defined as an integral, uh, indefinite integral. So that's the factorial function, um, came from the fact that we took the integral of e to the power of minus alpha x dx uh, equals... Okay, so this integral is the one that we are using to define our factorial function in the first place. And to be honest, it's this is one of the mysteries to me why we're using this particular integral to define our factorial function. Um, how did they come up with this? I have no idea. So that's one of the questions I'm going to clarify when I talk to my professor this week. And then I can let you know. Okay, if we evaluate this integral on the upper bound, which is minus, in, uh, which is infinity, this whole thing goes to zero. And if we plug in zero for x, this is one. So the end result is min minus one over alpha. But then remember, this is, uh, there is a minus, like you have zero minus, minus the whole thing, and we get plus one over alpha. And so now what they did in the textbook, they took the both sides of the equation and they differentiated each side with respect to alpha. And at the end, we're gonna arrive at this general formula that's gonna define our factorial function. So since we're differentiating, differentiating with respect to x, we take the, uh, minus x to b is a constant in front of alpha, and so differentiation is really easy in that case. And 
to differentiate this one, it's also quite easy. It's alpha to the power of minus 1, so the minus 1 comes uh, in front of this, and we got minus 1 over alpha squared, and this can also be rewritten as, you know, the, we can just cancel the minuses on each side. So we got this expression, and taking the derivative again, it's going to give us minus x squared to the power of minus alpha x dx, and this is alpha to the power of minus 2, so we get minus 2 um, alpha to the power of minus 3, which is minus 2 over alpha cubed. And again, we have a minus sign, which can be uh, omitted then. Um, yeah, let's do it one more time. Um, I have written it, uh, so again, the plus signs, uh, minus signs turned into plus signs, but this 6 I have written it in, uh, as a 6, as a product of 2 and 3, but I should have left it in the form actually like this, 3 times 2 times alpha to the fourth, which is 3 factorial alpha to the fourth, and this one can be think can be thought of as 2 factorial as alpha to the third, and this one can be thought of 1 factorial as alpha over alpha to the first, just to be explicit. And if we go on like this, uh, we see the pattern. Um, so this is our first differentiation, this is second, and this is third. So if we set n to equal to 3, like this is going to be n3, n equals to 2, n equals to 1, and here basically n equals to 0. We're not taking any derivatives there. Yes, so um, if we notice that our 3 here and 3 here, they have something in common with the third derivative, so that's reflected over there, so x to the power of n and minus alpha x dx and then n factorial, because if we continue like this, we're going to get 4 factorial here, 5 factorial and so on, like 4 factorial for the 4th derivative, 5 for the 5th, and so on. And um, down here we have alpha to the power of n plus 1, because as you notice, it's 3, it's 4, it's 2, 3, um, and so it goes like this. Um, and so this function, uh, this integral, defines uh, a factorial function, but it's only valid for integer values of n, uh, non-negative integers values of n. And um, the question is then, what if we have a negative integer, or what if n is non-integer and, you know, some fraction or decimal? So, um, and for those cases, the exact same function has been defined uh, a little bit differently and it's called gamma function. And that's basically what the gamma function is. It's a factorial function for non-integer um, and non-negative, uh, and negative integers and non-integers values of n. And what they did last, uh, le um, next to define the gamma function, so basically from here, um, they assume the alpha equals one, and also they um, set n equals p minus one. Um, and here, again, my question is, why do we use alpha, like if we set alpha equals 1, um, we get a simpler version of that, and we're going to get exactly the factorial uh, out of it, uh, because it's going to become n factorial. So, and that is what the gamma function of P has been defined as. Uh, wait, see, I made a mistake. We assumed that n is p minus 1, so that's exactly what it is. Um, it's p minus 1 factorial. So my first question was, and still is, a second mystery to me in the whole thing. Um, if alpha is equal to 1, 
well, I understand the point how they this came about, but I wonder why do we use alpha in the first place? Why don't we assume e to the power of minus x in the first place here? So I think that this alpha has to have some purpose uh, somewhere. I just don't really see it, at least not in the sense how we defined the gamma function, uh, because for that we just assumed alpha is 1. So that alpha must have some purpose. And I'm going to ask my professor about this one. And the second thing, uh, I do get it, why do we use uh, some other um, index or variable, whatever you want to call it, for n uh, to define the non integer values, but why do we use p minus 1? Like, what that minus 1 is going to give us? Like, what's the reasoning behind this? One of the things I was thinking, why we have to put the minus 1 in here, is because our goal is to have alpha to some power of p down here, and the only way we're going to get it if we have n as p minus 1, because if we put it in here, we're going to get p minus 1 plus 1, which is going to give us alpha to the p. And that's... But then, to define the factorial function, the gamma function, we set alpha equals 1 anyways, and that term disappears anyways. So, and again, we come back to the alpha. What is it? Um, but this is the... Uh, definition of the factorial function, this is definition of the gamma function, um, and it can also be generalized to define the negative numbers, uh, negative non-integers, or integers, um, so we can have uh, exact expression when evaluating something, instead of numerical approximation, but I, um, and I can use it, I can perfectly use it in examples, as I will show you uh, in a minute. Uh, how you can use these things to solve some problems, but uh, I don't understand these two points. Yeah, actually three points. Why did we use this initial function in the first place to define our factorial function uh, here, and then what's the purpose of alpha, and why integer n is equal to some non-integer p minus 1 what the minus 1 has to do with it. But I would suspect it has to do something with the power of alpha here. Um, and it's just a trick to make it work, to make to bring it into a certain form that we are after. I'm going to show you one more quick thing. How do we get this to be in a form of uh, the just the p factorial or just n factorial so that it can be used um, in different ways. And the way to get the p factorial on this side instead of p minus 1, we just increase that p uh, by 1 here. So we um, use gamma of p plus 1 as integral of 0 to infinity. So if we have p plus 1, this x is going to turn to just the power of p, because plus 1 minus 1 is going to give 0. This is unchanged x, and then here we have p plus 1 minus 1, and again we get our p factorial. And so p in this expression is no longer um, an integer, it's uh, meant to represent integers and non-integers alike, and later if we want to use these facts somehow in simplifying expressions. It's very convenient to have this type of gamma, uh, gamma of p plus 1, to be uh, expressed in terms of this um, as a recursion relation. So our goal now is to arrive at um, some expression that will uh, have this expressed in terms of this and not just defined as an integral. But definition of the integral like this really helps to understand what we're doing when we're solving problems, as I have found. I've done a few problems on that, and uh, knowing this and where this came from really helped me to know what to do when I was simplifying the expressions. Uh, so what I'm going to do next is uh, try to get this recursion relation. And the way we do this is we try to evaluate this integral and see what we get. 
Okay, to get the recursion relation, uh, we, uh, as I said, we're going to integrate it, um, try to evaluate it, and uh, we do it by, uh, we're going to try and do it by integrating by parts, because this is very logical to do in this case. And if our, uh, let's assume that this is our U, and this is our DD, um, then we're going to have, um, so if x to the power of b is defined as u, then the, our du is going to be as p x to the power of p minus 1 dx. Um, and so, yeah, so if this is our dv, dv, um, our v is then And so using this, we can uh, go ahead and evaluate this integral. And then I'm going to get um, uv, u times v. So u, we had x to the power of p times minus e to the power of p minus e to the power of p minus x du dx. Okay, so this uh, can be simplified a little bit. Okay, let's uh, clean this up a little bit to make it... Um, oh, by the way, this one is going to be integrated from 0 to minus and to infinity. And so if we integrate this first part, we're going to get 0, because um, if you plug in infinity to here, you're going to get 0. If you plug in 0, uh, this term goes to 0 as, as well. Um, and so what I left only was this integral. Minus and minus give you plus, and I'm going to take out the p. And rearrange it a little bit. And now, if you look at this, this expression here, here, this is our um, gamma of p. Uh, and so we can rewrite this. Look, this is what it is. And so. our recursion relation and we were able to express um, gamma of p plus 1 in terms of gamma of p and that relation is very useful in simplifying expressions as you will see um, in the next video. Yeah, so that's about it for this um, kind of study with me. I don't know, I, I, my intent was not to teach you something because I'm still learning myself but um, it's sort of very active study with me, I think. So, I'll leave you with that, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.